Lore and gaming fit perfectly together. There's something super cool about diving into a game and learning it's not just about the gameplay, but not all lore is created equal. But here's the thing, a game doesn't need lore to be amazing. There are tons of epic games out there with zero backstory and nobody's complaining. But if a game decides to weave in some lore, it's got to be good. Otherwise, it might just drag the whole game down. And this is the worst lore in modern gaming. In the world of shooters, lore often comes alive in campaigns and PvE modes. Online games shouldn't skimp on their stories. But not every game hits the mark. Rainbow Six Siege has seen its narrative quality dip, leading to confusion among players about the current lore. Yet the game's compelling gameplay keeps many too engaged to focus on its storytelling flaws. Those brave enough to explore Siege's lore are met with a perplexing and tangled narrative. Still, understanding Rainbow Six's origins, starting with its 1998 debut tied to a Tom Clancy novel, gives a fascinating glimpse into its commitment to tension-filled military action and strategic depth. Foundational elements that have defined the series despite its narrative problems. When Rainbow Six Siege first hit the scene, its trailer got everyone hyped up, promising a realistic FPS experience that felt new and exciting. There was something about its intense vibe, the detailed gear, and how every match was intense. The opening scene was epic, introducing us to the White Mass, a dangerous group causing chaos worldwide, and setting up Rainbow, the elite squad, to stop them. It was exactly the kind of high-stakes, realistic action the game boasted about. The White Mass were the perfect villains for Siege, a shadowy threat that felt all too real. They didn't need any fancy tricks, just sheer efficiency and guerrilla tactics that genuinely made your heart race. Early on, Siege had these PvE missions, situations that were insanely cool because you got to face off against the White Mask directly. The gameplay was all about strategy and patience, which just amped up the intensity. Facing the White Mask was a thrill. They were cunning, using everything from stun grenades to human shields to get the jump on you, making every mission a nerve-wracking experience. All this combined made Siege early days unforgettable. The lore set the stage for some of the most immersive and challenging gameplay around, proving that a well-thought-out backstory can elevate a game to new heights. The key to outwitting the white mass often boiled down to teamwork and smart strategy. And when you hopped into multiplayer, it almost felt like each match was a rehearsal for taking them on, tying the whole experience together in this super immersive way. Then came Article 5, the grand finale of the PvE saga. This mission really took things to another level. The whole map was covered in gas, turning your Hodid into a virtual hazmat mask view. It was an unforgettable way to wrap up the first chapter of PvE missions, blending the game's lore and action perfectly. But little did we know, that was the end of the line for such missions. No more epic scenarios came after that, leaving us all a bit nostalgic. For a bit, it felt like Siege was more about rolling out new operators than telling stories. Then Operation Chimera hit us with a curveball, the outbreak event. Suddenly, we went from tactical realism to fighting off alien zombies. It was a huge, unexpected jump, kind of like switching from a thriller to a horror movie overnight. Despite being a leap from the usual rainbow vibe, it somehow worked, staying true to the game's essence. With a bit of a Tom Clancy twist, Ash even had to get permission to tackle this new threat, showing the blend of action and red tape. This twist was so big it led to a spin-off game. But after Outbreak, the game's storyline started to unravel, drifting from its solid foundation into more of an identity crisis. By 2020, the white masks were old news, with just whispers of them left. This marked a new chapter, one that most of us would have skipped if we could. With the white mask gone, Aurelia climbed the career ladder and Harry took over. Harry's era was, well, Let's just say no one was prepared for it. He changed things by introducing a massive sports arena, transforming our elite operatives into something akin to celebrity athletes with legions of fans cheering them on. This wasn't your average training ground. It was part spectacle, part bizarre team building exercise, complete with BB guns, simulation suits, and even live commentators jazzing up the crowd. 
It felt like a cross between reality TV and a high-stakes paintball match. Why, you ask? Well, the official line was that it was all to prep Rainbow for every possible scenario and to foster team spirit by having them live and train together. But it didn't exactly pan out, so they wanted to make Sega's story more comprehensive and scalable. But let's be real, it strayed pretty far from the whole gritty, tactical vibe we originally loved. Suddenly, our covert operators were fighting out in front of crowds for points, using tech that should have been classified. It was like they forgot they were supposed to be sneaky, and it didn't stop there. Harry, in a moment of questionable brilliance, decided to change things by bringing in Nighthaven, known for their, let's say, unique style. Of course, they clashed with Rainbow's way of doing things right away. It was like if Talon from Overwatch crashed a team-building retreat. Then came the tournament. Ash and Kali ended up paired together. Kali uses Ash as bait in a move straight out of reality TV, starting a crazy fight. This whole mess caused a split in Rainbow, with operators choosing sides. The story turned into something straight out of a soap opera, with betrayals, secret plots, and even Ella and Zofia, who are supposed to be sisters, suddenly at each other's throats. Then out of nowhere, we're thrown into a murder mystery. A new operator pops up, and the whole thing revolves around bullets from Nighthaven. Just when we thought we'd seen it all, it gets worse. Our Rainbow team, thinking they're in the middle of an intense espionage thriller, finds out they've been tricked, and now there's a helicopter attack linked to Nighthaven. With just one bullet as their lead, they jump straight into action hero mode, deciding to break into Nighthaven's HQ, because that's obviously the next logical step, right? The line between high-stakes counterterrorism and dramatic daytime TV blur more with every twist and turn. So Nock, our go-to for staying hidden, gets spotted and tracked down by bees. Yes, bees. Then Grimm from Nighthaven shows up not to start a huge fight, but just to warn her. It felt like a big moment was coming, but really it was just a better not see you again kind of deal. Rainbow decides maybe Nighthaven isn't the bad guy here after all. Later, Rainbow faces Nighthaven again, but this time, it's just to tell them to back off. That's when they find out all their stuff's been stolen, making their fight seem pointless. The guy behind all this? Damos. He tries and fails to take down Rainbow, complains about how Rainbow's gone soft, and then just leaves. All this drama tried to make Siege's story cooler and more complex, but it just ended up confusing. With all the plot twists and surprises, the story feels out of sync with the actual game. Like if Rainbow and Nighthaven are supposed to be enemies, why are they training together? And Damos, who's supposed to be the big villain, just ends up hanging out with everyone else. It's like a weird office dynamic where everyone's supposed to be serious, but ends up just being awkward. The lore took a detour into reality TV territory, complete with internal drama and personality clashes, sidelining the tactical counterterrorism vibe we signed up for. The stadium became a stage for these soap opera antics, diluting the game's original essence and leaving us yearning for the days when Rainbow Six was about tackling real threats with high stakes, not scoring points in an airsoft league. Fans have been loud and clear about wanting the old grittier siege back, but reverting to a more serious tone would mean Ubisoft investing in single-player content again. And let's be real, they seem more keen on catering to the esports crowd and cutting costs than enriching the game's world. As for where the story's headed, who knows? Damas might break free and cause chaos, still playable in-game, because of consistency. At this point, the lore feels like a lost cause, disconnected from both the gameplay and its roots. Despite Siege's success, its narrative's taken a hit, turning what could have been a compelling story into a convoluted mess that's hard to take seriously. But hey, make sure to like, subscribe, and share if you agree.